So uh, next, I want to talk about uh, some important uh, concepts within the field of machine learning, which is uh, necessary to, to know about before you can practice machine learning. Um, these are some of them are somewhat mathematical and technical. Uh, so don't despair if you don't get all of this at once. And this is just to give an, an overview and a sort of a, a gut feeling uh, as to what's going on. Uh, I'll try to to make it this at least a little bit uh, clear. <clears throat> but uh, anyone who has ever done machine learning or any kind of data-driven modeling knows that you never get a data-driven model to be perfect. There's always going to be error between uh, what your model says and what the physical world actually does. Uh, and mathematically, we often sh uh, model the real world or just describe the real world as, let's say, y, or in some cases, f of x. So this is a representation of the actual system. And the model's predictions is then f with this hot symbol above. So we can think of the, the error of the system as the expected difference between the real world and the machine learning model. And mathematically, this can be shown to be consisting of, of three different parts. So one contribution to the overall error of your machine learning model is what we call the bias. And that is the difference between the uh, sort of average prediction of your model and how the actual system behaves. So you can, it's the expected model behavior uh, minus the actual system. So that, that's what we call the bias. So this is an error which uh, represents in your model predicting something wrong. Uh, so it mispredicts uh, what the physical system is going to do. Uh, that would be, um, for example, uh, this uh, drawing on the left here. I don't know, I guess you could say this is like an archery target, so someone shooting arrows. So in the cases where you have a high bias, you would miss the truth. So you will be shooting over here or over here. So your average prediction is going to be here or here. Uh, and it's, it's not where the true value actually is. Then you have a bias error. That is, your model is predicting something which is wrong. Uh, another kind of error which a machine learning model prediction will uh, include is what we call variance. That is the variation between each individual prediction and the expected or average prediction. So how much does the prediction vary uh, if the system is kept sort of constant? Uh, and that's uh, in the drawing what you have in this direction. So here you have an example of something which has very low variance because all the predictions is tightly grouped. And here you have high variance. So in this case, you have um, uh, spread out predictions. So the predictions is of jumping all around. Um, and of course, the ideal thing is to have low bias and low variance. Then you have some spread out, but the average is exactly the truth value, bullseye. Uh, but you can also uh, have situations where you have low bias, but high variance. So your average prediction is pretty good. Your model actually understands more or less what the system is doing, but it's influenced by some sort of random component. So it's it's uh, uh, missing uh, the target as a random. There is some, some random contribution to your prediction, which means that every individual uh, prediction is still quite wrong, even though your model has sort of learned the necessary information to, un to predict how the system behaves. And this scenario is typical of what we call overfitting, which we will come back to. Whereas this scenario is typical of what we call underfitting. So this is a model which is has not learned the necessary system behavior. This is a model that has learned the system behavior, but is still predicting with high variance. So it has some, some randomness into it. But there's also a very important term over here. Uh, I said before that uh, in engineering, we never apply machine learning methods to anything which has to be perfect. Because in any data-driven uh, methodology, there's always going to be some residual error over here, which we simply cannot get rid of. So even if you have uh, 
zero bias and zero variance, which never happens, there is always going to be some error because uh, no matter how much description power uh, your model structure has, it will never be able to capture perfectly the real system. There's always going to be some error which you, you cannot get rid of. And that, that's important to keep in mind, that anything based on machine learning will have some sort of error, no matter what you do. Now, uh, anyone who has looked up uh, machine learning uh, courses or, or read anything about machine learning is probably come across these terms overfitting and perhaps even underfitting uh, at some point, because these are central topics to, to machine learning. Um, it's a little bit difficult to understand until you actually try working on it, uh, but I'll try to give you some intuition uh, what this means. So perhaps underfitting is the easiest to understand, because a model which is underfitting uh, is a model that is simply uh, failed to learn the necessary knowledge uh, in the system, the knowledge about the system. It, it cannot predict what the system is doing. One potential uh, source of underfitting is a model structure that is too simple. Uh, this is something which happens uh, in the world of extended command filters, for example, where you are approximating a nonlinear system by linear uh, state transition matrices. And if this is a very poor approximation, then your uh, linearized model will, will underfit the actual system because it cannot describe the behavior of the, the true system. Uh, in machine learning, it can happen uh, either because you have, uh, for example, chosen a too simple or too... Uh, and not, not enough, not complex enough um, neural network. That would be one possible scenario where you might see uh, underfitting. But also it can happen if you don't train your model enough. So when you start with a model that is pretty much randomized, and then you start calibrating it, uh, if you don't calibrate it enough, you don't have enough data, uh, you can still have a model which fails to learn the necessary information, even though the model structure is sufficiently complex to to capture it, but if the data doesn't contain the information you need, you might still end up with an, in an underfitting scenario. Overfitting, on the other hand, uh, is slightly more difficult to understand. Uh, but in, in overfitting, what happens is that uh, if you have a way too complex uh, model structure uh, and you train that model structure uh, as much as you possibly can for a given set of data. So you let the training run to, to infinity, let's say, in the limit. Then you could end up with a model structure that learns uh, to predict uh, the random uh, influences of noise, so the random variances in your training data. And those are things which is not really representative of the actual system, but it can be random fluctuations due to measurement noise or so on. Uh, and if you have a model which learns to, to sort of predict those random changes and then expects to see the same random changes in the new data when you want to use your model to, to actually predict something, then that leads to poor prediction behavior on, on this new independent data. This is a typical uh, situation where you will see a high variance in your uh, prediction errors. Uh, I have sometimes used the, the analogy of data-driven modeling uh, to the technique which is called vacuum forming. Uh, in vacuum forming, uh, you try to make a mold of some physical object. So you have a piece of uh, heated melted plastic which is pressed onto some object uh, and then a vacuum or a suction of air is used to make this uh, soft piece of plastic fit the object in question and thereby, when cooled, uh, creates a mold of this object. Um, and you can sort of think of this uh, underfitting scenario as trying to do vacuum forming uh, with a plastic sheet which isn't sufficiently soft. So it, for example, doesn't want to bend in a particular way because it doesn't have the complexity to fit over the object that you are interested in making a mold of. Uh, 
uh, whereas the overfitting scenario would be a plastic sheet which is too soft so that it would uh, pick up uh, particles of dust for example on the surface of the object and then when you go to make a mold or make a cast with your mold then you would also make a mold of the dust particles for example that's kind of an analogy to under and overfitting so how can we then uh, prevent this of over and underfitting um, well, the trick is uh, to choose uh, and balance uh, complexity. Uh, one very common recommendation in, to avoid overfitting is to simply have enough data. Because the more data you have, the less chance there is that you end up learning uh, random fluctuations of the noise. Um, and to avoid underfitting, uh, the trick is to uh, avoid the bias by having a model which is uh, sufficiently complex to, to capture the system uh, and to uh, make sure that the data that you are using actually has the knowledge uh, that you are interested in so that there is knowledge there for the model to latch onto during training and thereby learn the, the necessary uh, system behavior. It's possible to look at this uh, graphically, uh, what's going on when you train a model or a model complexity. So in this case, this is valid for model complexity, but in the machine learning world, this is also it can be thought of as how how long you train a model. So how hard do you train a model? How, how long do you run the training algorithms for? It turns out that when you start off with a very simple model or a model which is just could be complex but completely randomized and not trained, then you would have a very high bias. And as the complexity increases or the training level increases, your bias will go down because you will fit the system better and better. But at some point you start to come into the overfitting territory and then your variance will increase. And since the error, as we saw before, is the sum of variance plus bias squared plus this small contribution here, which you sort of can never get rid of. Uh, there's going to be some sort of a, a, a sweet spot here where you have minimum bias and minimum variance. So there's always some sort of balance point somewhere where the complexity or the training level is just right to get the optimal uh, performance out of your machine learning model. And one of the tricks to being a good uh, machine learning engineer uh, is having this touch or the, the, the practical hands-on experience to, to know how to set up a machine learning system uh, to uh, find this sort of optimum point or something near this optimum point. That's in many cases difficult uh, to obtain and requires a lot of trial and error. Uh, one way to uh, to help avoid overfitting, and there has been a lot of research uh, into into this uh, into techniques to avoid overfitting, because machine learning methods tend to to be uh, built with very complex model structures that are prone to overfitting. So there's been a lot of interest and research into how to avoid this. Uh, and one technique is what we call regularization, and that is a way to to limit or constrain the complexity uh, by making a complex model behave uh, less complex than it really is. And it's actually a key uh, key concept in, in making machine learning work. Uh, you really need, in, in most cases, some form of regularization. And there, there's a lot of different techniques to, to choose from. I won't go into any details uh, suggested uh, or interested uh, listeners can, can look this up on your own. It's really more of a, a advanced uh, topic for later. Uh, but it, it does depend on, on whatever uh, method you are using. So different methods like neural network or random forests, they have different regularization techniques. But the simplest form of regularization is really just using a lot of data. Uh, some, some scientists and machine learning experts argue that using lots of data should be considered a form of regularization. Um, another 
important uh, topic within machine learning, uh, which is somewhat related to these uh, concepts of error decomposition and over underfitting, uh, is this idea of model validation. This is actually very important in, in all modeling uh, tasks, but uh, for the purpose of this talk, it's the machine learning world we are interested in. And I specifically want to emphasize the importance of, of using uh, independent data for, for model validation. Um, and model validation is uh, the st a step uh, in the process of doing uh, machine learning in where you will try to test your calibrated model uh, in order to figure out how good can you reasonably expect this model to perform in the real world. So we try to estimate uh, what happens when the model leaves the computer, leaves the lab and goes out into the real world and does its job. How, how good will it be? That is of course the only sort of important thing in the engineering. We, all the fancy methods and mathematics and software engineering in the world is, is not uh, of any value to us engineers unless it can be used for some practical gain. And therefore, we need to put a lot of emphasis on this uh, topic of, of uh, model validation. So we can think of the process of developing a machine learning model uh, as three phases, where first we have the uh, training of a model, uh, where you run the calibration algorithm or try to, to fit the model to your data uh, for a given configuration of uh, hyperparameters. Uh, but then once you have calibrated your model, uh, you need to examine the results on the training set and test uh, different uh, configurations of your algorithm. For example, different neural network structures, different hyperparameters, different learning rates and so on. It's a, a large number of hyperparameters usually in machine learning methods. Hyperparameters is parameters of the method itself, things like uh, the learning rate of the optimization algorithm, for example, uh, the structure of the neural networks, how many hidden layers should you have, how many nodes per, per layer, and so on. All of these things are, uh, as I mentioned before, difficult to give general guidelines for, uh, and it comes down to experimentation and uh, practical experience. But the important part is that we need to uh, test different configurations. It's never good to just try one configuration, train that, and then hope for the best. Uh, you always have to test different configurations to try to find the settings of your method which works the best for your particular problem. So that would be the second phase, where you compare different configurations, and then you go back to the first phase, train a new model, compare the configurations to previous, and then back to training again. So it's three different modes there of, of machine learning. But then the last phase, uh, which is uh, the most important one, is to actually test the best configuration that you are able to find against uh, data to see how well this configuration, the best you can come up with. Uh, the, after training, of course, you train the model and then choose the one which has the uh, best uh, performance out of all your configurations. Uh, and then you do a uh, an analysis of that model by testing it on data to see how well it performs. And the performance in the third phase is really the only performance that is any kind of useful metric uh, or prediction of how well your uh, trained machine learning model will perform in the real world. And there's a very important point uh, to make that for these three uh, phases, uh, we need to use three independent data sets. And very often in machine learning, we talk about uh, training, validation, and test sets. Uh, and that is that we have one set of data, which we will use to train all of the models. And then we have a validation set, which we use uh, to, to, uh, to predict each model. Each model is used to predict the validation set. And we use that to compare different configurations. And then we hold the last third data set uh, to be used for the th third phase, the, the final testing. And that's used then only once. So the training set is used for every model. Uh, 
The validation set is used for every model, but in order to give a fair comparison of different configurations, we can't really compare performance on the training set because uh, machine learning models always performs better on the training set than on uh, independent data. That's that's what overfitting does. Um, so we need to have three independent data sets. Now there are ways we can cheat. There are something called uh, cross correlation. Uh, sorry, um, yeah, I forgot the name. There are ways we can cheat uh, where we can. Uh, use things like uh, leave one out uh, methods in order to fake having uh, multiple data sets. <coughs> we can use these uh, cross validation techniques, uh, such as leave one out cross validation, um, which is a way of sort of faking that you have independent data. But it, it really isn't independent data, so it's it's never as good as actually having three independent data sets. But there, there is a lot of debate about this in the machine learning uh, science world, uh, how to do model validation if you can afford to have three independent data sets. But in any cases where you can afford to collect three independent data sets, that is uh, the best you can do in order to give a fair and honest uh, validation of, of your work. So, um, in part two, uh, I want to uh, go over briefly some of the most used um, methods in machine learning, basically that of artificial neural networks and decision trees. And also I will say a little bit about uh, some other sort of methods of machine learning, what's called ensemble models or boosting and bagging. These are techniques that can be applied to, to machine learning um, methods, so it's part of the method methodology of machine learning. Um, so I guess that uh, most people have heard about artificial neural networks by now and have some, some notion of what this is. Uh, and put briefly, then, as the name implies, an artificial neural network is a bunch of neurons that's connected together into a network. Uh, and a neuron is, is nothing more than a simple computational unit. Uh, it's this tiny little mathematical operation, uh, but we connect together many of these operations into a network. I mentioned before that this is typical of machine learning methods, that you have some very simple building blocks connected together in large numbers to form uh, very complex structures. And this is indeed true of, of neural networks as well. Uh, it's interesting to note that neural networks is inspired by nature. Uh, it was never intended to in any way copy or simulate the way a biological uh, neural uh, network or biological brain works. Uh, nobody's really uh, thinking that an artificial neural network is a copy of, of nature in any way. It's inspired by it, but it's, it's not intended to be a simulation or a copy. Uh, the simplest uh, neural network uh, structure that we can use is something called a feed-forward network, which is actually what we have depicted here, where we have a bunch of inputs that is connected to all of our uh, neurons in the hidden layer. And then the output of each neuron becomes the input uh, of each. So in the this layer, uh, the outputs is connected to the inputs of all the neurons on the next layer. So there's four neurons here. And this one has four inputs, uh, one for each output of the neurons. So the outputs becomes the inputs of all the neurons in the next layer. That's a fully connected feedforward uh, neural network. This is the, the simplest structure uh, we can have. So how do we actually uh, get from uh, a neuron to a network? Um, the simple compute unit, as I mentioned, uh, the neuron is, uh, can be described mathematically uh, as this function. So the output y is the weighted sum of the inputs. So in this case, let's say we have three inputs, x1, x2, x3. And 
each of those inputs is multiplied by a weight and then it's summed together. So that's what this means. We take the sum over all the inputs of W times X, like this. But then we have uh, a bias, which is uh, simply an offset, which is added to the weighted sum that can shift uh, the weighted sum up or down. And to this weighted sum, we apply some nonlinear activation function, we call it this F act, in order to compute the, the actual output. This is a very simple little uh, mathematical operation. It's just a weighted sum plus some activation function, and that's that's your neural output. Now we can mathematically rewrite this a little bit. If we imagine that we have an artificial input, which we'll call x0, uh, which always has the value 1, and then we just rename the bias uh, b into v0, and then we stack the weights and the inputs, including our artificial x0, into vectors. And then we can write this weighted sum as simply the transpose of the weighting matrix times the input vector. So the uh, weight vector times the input vector. And that's mathematically equivalent to what we have here. And of course we have to apply the activation function uh, and we get the same output. But now remember that we have neurons stacked in layers where all the neurons in one layer has exactly the same inputs, but they have different weights. So if you now have let y be a vector, so it's not a scalar anymore, it's a vector, uh, and then we have the input vector to the layer x, and we take these weighting vectors here, which we transpose to make uh, row vectors of them, and we stack the weighting vectors of each neuron on top of each other to form a matrix. Then we can actually express this uh, neuron uh, operations for an entire uh, layer of connected neurons as this simple equation here. This is now not a single neuron anymore, it's one layer of neurons. And then we have to of course apply the activation function, which in this case is applied element-wise on the final uh, column vector, which this becomes. So that's now the layer uh, in the feedforward neural network. But this can actually be taken uh, one step further, because we saw in the previous slide that the output of one layer becomes the input of the next layer, and then the output of that layer again becomes the input of the next layer, and so on and so on. And this can be expressed such as this, where we have the weighting matrix for the first layer multiplied by the inputs to the network over here, and then apply activation function in layer one. Then we have the output vector of the whole first layer, which we then take as the input vector of the second layer. So here we have the output of the first layer multiplied by the weighting matrix of the second layer and then apply an activation function. Then we get output of the second layer times weighting matrix of the third layer, because that's now the input to the third, third layer, and so on and so on, until we actually reach the vector outputs here. So I think this is pretty interesting mathematically to show that this idea of connecting neurons together like this uh, in this sort of complicated, actually this is a very simple neural network, but it still looks complex, a bunch of interconnections and lines going everywhere. But actually this structure can be expressed using linear algebra with a simple one line uh, equation. It's nonlinear, of course, because we have activation functions everywhere. Uh, but still, it is expressible by uh, matrix uh, multiplication uh, like this. That, that's really all a neural network is doing, these this simple operations here. So, the so question is why this uh, neural network structures is so powerful? Why can this... Uh, techniques be used for things uh, and to solve problems that doesn't have any other uh, there can be used to solve problems that for which there exist no other solutions like image recognition for example uh, data scientists tried for for many years to come up with computer algorithms that could classify images and tell differences between cats and dogs for example but it turned out to be almost impossible to uh, 
to manually write rules into sort of white box models in order to describe the knowledge, which for us humans is very easy to tell the difference between cats and dogs. From two years old, we already learn difference between uh, this and different animals. It's very easy for a human to, to learn to, to separate that. But for a computer, it turns out to be really, really difficult. But within machine learning and neural networks, uh, it's very possible to, to train uh, models to obtain that sort of knowledge which is needed to look at a computerized image and uh, figure out what that image contains. So before I continue, I should point out one more fact uh, about this equation, which is that this is not just simply a neural network, but it's actually also a deep learning neural network, because this structure contains multiple hidden layers. So even this magic of deep learning, which uh, so much talked about in, in media, can be sort of expressed as uh, a simple nonlinear equation like this. Now we should point out that the field of deep learning is, is much more uh, complex than just feedforward neural networks. There is a bunch of other network architectures which isn't as easily expressible as this. Uh, but, but in principle, this is where uh, deep learning started, with the idea that you can connect many layers together in this type of structure. And the reason why this is so powerful is something which we call uh, abstraction. And abstraction is the idea that uh, rather than trying to go directly from, let's say, the input, uh, which in the case of images is pixels, to some sort of output, which is a class of object in the image, we instead let each layer uh, try to focus on some subset of this problem. So, uh, for example, the first layer here might be uh, trained to look for edges or lines in the image. And then the second layer can look for corners or contours, like more curvy uh, lines in the image. And perhaps the, the third layer learns to recognize from these different uh, curved lines and, and more complex uh, structures uh, object parts. So it has some notion that there can be a wheel or a face or something in the image. And then the final classification can use these object parts in order to, to guess uh, the class of the object in the image. Uh, and this is naturally much simpler uh, to go through these steps in order to uh, figure out the classification of an image. But it's very important to understand that this abstraction is something that uh, is not happening because the algorithm is telling uh, or the algorithm is, is instructed to do abstraction. This is something which happens naturally because this structure allows for that, because this layered structure of neurons allows abstraction to happen naturally. And abstraction turns out to be sort of an optimal way of solving the problem. So by sort of putting pressure on the weights of the uh, neurons to come up with an optimal solution, uh, which is what we do during the training of neural networks, this abstraction effect sort of happens naturally. But this is uh, one explanation why deep learning is so powerful, that it allows uh, abstraction to happen. Uh, another uh, machine learning method, which I want to uh, say something about, is uh, decision trees. I know that, uh, especially the last five years, uh, a lot of the emphasis in the machine learning world has been on, on neural networks. But nevertheless, it is uh, interesting also to study decision trees because there have been some groundbreaking uh, research and methodology uh, which uses decision trees as the sort of base model. And therefore, it's also useful to discuss that. And it's also actually, uh, from a learning point of view, uh, important to understand this uh, decision trees because it helps to, to make clear um, what machine learning is, is, is doing. So, as I mentioned briefly before, uh, a decision tree uh, is a model structure that is based on splitting the, the data uh, based on some criteria in, in each uh, node. So, the decision tree consists of nodes, which is these uh, questions or tests. And then after each node, uh, 
there is some possible uh, answers or trajectories and we can then go to either another node or a leaf which is sort of a conclusion or an end on the tree then the tree sort of stops at the leaf and each new data uh, sample that we want to classify will then have to travel through this tree in some way this is a, a very simple model obviously it's just a bunch of uh, if tests or uh, conditions uh, if some variable is above or below a threshold um, that makes it very fast to train <coughs> sorry makes it very fast to train uh, and also it means that we can only test uh, when we try to calibrate a decision tree uh, we only test on the splitting thresholds that are relevant for our data so let's say we are looking to train uh, trees such as in this case which we deal with the height of uh, people if the data set that we are using for training contains people at 180 centimeters and 185 centimeters and no one between 180 and 185 there is no point in testing uh, this threshold at 181 182 183 184 for example because it would be the same tree there are no if there are no people uh, between 180 and 185 then we would just test a threshold at 182.5 which is directly between those two values uh, so it means that we have a discrete set of possible candidates for these thresholds uh, which makes the training uh, much much faster than a neural network for example where the, the sort of the training space is continuous um, that is a, a very clear advantage of decision trees that these splits have a discrete final set of possible candidates to, to try so, as an example of a decision tree, if you look at this image to the left here, this is obviously a model <coughs> that tries to classify if a person is male or female. Uh, and it does that by first testing if the person is above 180 centimeters, in which case it will classify the person as a male. Uh, if this person is less than 180 centimeters, it will check the person's weight. If the weight is above 80 kilograms, it will classify as male. <laughs> Otherwise, it will classify as female. So clearly, this is a very poor model. It's, I'm sure everyone can think of some person which would then be misclassified by this model. But that is actually an interesting point, that decision tree models by themselves uh, will very often be wrong. Uh, and actually, as we will see in a couple of slides, they are sometimes engineered to be uh, wrong on purpose or at least have a high chance of being wrong uh, and instead what we tend to do in practice is that we have not one decision tree but a whole bunch of decision trees so let's say that you have 100 of these very simple models uh, as depicted here but with slightly different thresholds so in one model maybe anyone above 180 will be considered male in another model anyone above 160 will be considered male maybe some models will put a threshold at 200 uh, and if you have 100 such models with slightly different configurations and slightly different thresholds and then you pass uh, one new person through all 100 models and then you for example take the majority vote over these 100 models to see what your final classification will be and that turns out to be uh, a pretty good machine learning technique. And since this decision trees is so quick to train, then training 100 models is, is not infeasible to you. It's, it's fast to do that, especially when you keep the structure this simple. You can train maybe thousands of these trees and then do majority vote on that. That turns out to be a pretty good machine learning technique. But the question then is, is how do you create these different model structures because if you just run the algorithm over the same set of data repeatedly you will get exactly the same tree so you need to introduce variation into your training process somehow which causes the result to come out slightly different every time uh, and that is the main sort of difference between the different decision tree algorithms is in, in how they actually 
to introduce this variation. And this brings us to this notion of ensemble models, because that's actually what we just discussed. This idea that having uh, multiple models and somehow combining uh, the prediction results from multiple models very often turns out to be better than a single model. And this is a very powerful idea. And it can also be used with neural networks, uh, as for example this Schwenk and Benjo uh, paper does, uh, but it is perhaps most typically used in, in decision trees. So the question is then, how do we create these ensembles? Uh, if we can come up with some clever techniques to do that. And two such techniques is uh, what we call boosting uh, and uh, bootstrap aggregating or bagging. Uh, Random Forest, for example, is based on, on boosting. Uh, and another famous decision tree algorithm called uh, XG boost is also based on boost boosting. Sorry, random forest is based on bootstrap aggregation. Uh, I won't go into too much details on this. Um, that's a topic for for another time. Uh, it's plenty of resources online for for anyone who is interested in, in learning more about this. But the key takeaway is the usefulness of ensemble models and the fact that uh, there are some established techniques on, on how to do this. So uh, the final part of this uh, talk is to just briefly give an overview of different uh, frameworks and softwares that are out there uh, for those who are interested in, in trying out uh, machine learning. Uh, as I mentioned repeatedly already, the, the difficult part about machine learning is really uh, collecting data and um, ensuring that the knowledge you are looking for is in the data to begin with. Uh, and applying the frameworks is, is not, uh, in general, the hard part. One reason for that is the popularity of machine learning uh, and the availability of uh, tutorials and guides that will explain in detail how to apply these tools but also the fact that uh, a lot of these frameworks are available for free uh, and easily accessible. So of course the, the main tool for machine learning, I think it's pretty uncontroversial to say, is, is the Python programming language. Uh, every machine learning course I've ever seen uh, starts out with Python. Um, and there is a bunch of packages there, which is uh, important to know about. So you have, for example, uh, packages NumPy and SciPy, uh, which contains a lot of uh, methods for doing um, sort of scientific computing, MATLAB type things. You can do uh, array multiplications, metric multiplications, uh, FFT analysis, filtering, all these signal processing sort of things. Uh, so data pre-processing, uh, cutting and slicing arrays and all of these things. All of that is uh, covered by NumPy and SciPy. You have the Pandas package, which holds a lot of uh, pre-processing uh, tools. Uh, it's a very powerful way of loading data from databases and, and files and cutting and slicing and extracting the information you need. Some very nice tools for that. Uh, for the plotting part, uh, it's uh, um, many frameworks available. Matplotlib is perhaps the most uh, commonly used, but there is a bunch of other ones. Um, for the actual machine learning, there is uh, scikit-learn, which has a lot of regression and classification machine uh, type things. Uh, and then also uh, PyTorch, which is a popular uh, machine learning framework, perhaps the, the most popular in, in the Python world. Uh, there is also a bunch of other tools like Fast AI, which is a framework that sits on top of PyTorch and tries to make uh, this whole interface and, and the application of the PyTorch framework easier. Um, there is a TensorFlow uh, from Google, which also has a, a Python uh, interface. Uh, 
uh, as is the case with many of these uh, frameworks, even NumPy and SciPy and all these things, it's many of these tools is actually not really written in Python. There is some some uh, Fortran or C engine uh, in the back end, and then we just use Python to configure everything. That's how it works with TensorFlow. Uh, I'm not sure actually PyTorch, but I would guess it's similar story there. The Python works as the scripting language on how to configure uh, your methods. Uh, yeah, uh, nice thing is that uh, all of these frameworks are freely available. Uh, support is also free, which can be both an advantage and a disadvantage, uh, because you don't have the any powerful corporation behind which has a vested economical interest in making the frameworks work. It can be a bit of a learning curve uh, to get them to work, but there is usually plenty of help to be found online if you get stuck on something. The, the TensorFlow uh, framework, uh, I added a separate uh, discussion on that. Uh, and, uh, this is, of course, uh, Google's engine. And as I mentioned, it's a, sort of a, a background, uh, very fast computational engine. In my experience, somewhat difficult to use, but there are interface layers such as Keras, which is designed to, to make the use of, of TensorFlow easier. Uh, this this frameworks as well as the ones in the previous slide they are all in, in continuous development it's it's new features being added all the time so it's uh, it's a job in itself just to keep track on on what these different frameworks can do they are of course also competing with each other to some extent um, the R language is also uh, worth noting this is typically a uh, statistics a statisticians language has a lot of uh, nice features for doing statistical modeling. Again, some learning curve, but it's it's not too difficult syntax to learn. It's similar to Python, uh, but it's a sort of a separate programming language. Uh, but there is lots of methods available uh, through R, uh, like the C5.0, which is a decision tree or decision rule based uh, method, random forest, XGBoost. Uh, perhaps there are, I haven't actually checked I would guess that actually Python has more uh, more methods available now, but R is also high up there uh, when it comes to priority of which interface language to use for, for machine learning methods. It's a bit obscure in the engineering world. I don't know many p engineers who, who studied the R language, but it is uh, something worth, worth uh, at least knowing about. And for those who are uh, familiar with Visual Studio, there is a, an MRAN uh, uh, version uh, of, uh, or MRAN repo, which is Microsoft's uh, free version of the Seran repo, uh, which is the R uh, sort of, uh, library of, of functions. So it's, it's possible to use R from within Visual Studio. MATLAB, of course, uh, has a lot of machine learning tools. Um, and in my experience, it's some of the best uh, machine learning implementations in the world. Uh, it's available in, in the MATLAB package. But of course, it's a professional framework. Um, it's easy to use, very robust, well tested. Plenty of support and books available, uh, more so than the Python world. Um, but as a professional framework, it also has a professional price. So unless you have a university, to cover your license costs, uh, it's very, very expensive to, to run professionally. Another alternative is the Azure and Visual Studio world for Microsoft. Also, lots of machine learning uh, tools available there. Uh, Azure, of course, is an online cloud computing platform. So it has some uh, advantages in, in that you can rent uh, computation power in the cloud. Uh, to get your calibration done more quickly. Um, but it's not free, it costs money to, to use Azure. There are, uh, from Visual Studio 2017 and onwards, there are artificial intelligence and machine learning packages available also here, like the Cognitive Toolkit uh, and the interfaces to TensorFlow and PyTorch and so on available in the Microsoft uh, tools landscape as well. <coughs> 
So um, that's the last of my uh, lecture. Um, the takeaway message, what I want you to remember from this, uh, what is now nearly two hours of talking, is that also for machine learning, uh, models represent knowledge of some physical uh, underlying system. And that's what machine learning is, 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 is doing, is extracting uh, knowledge from data about some physical system. Uh, and therefore it's very important, as I repeatedly stated, uh, to pay close attention to your data collection process and ensure that the knowledge you wish to extract from data and encode in your model is available in the data set to begin with. Uh, another important takeaway message is that um, many of the machine learning techniques or most machine learning techniques are based on, on simple principles, uh, which is then combined to complex models. That's what sort of sets machine learning apart from uh, many other data-driven modeling techniques. They, they tend to be inspired by nature, not always, but that's sort of the, the typical thing with neurons and trees and so on. Uh, and that this complexity in the model structure gives machine learning uh, model structures high description power. Uh, this, together with the abstraction phenomenon which we discussed, is kind of what makes machine learning uh, able to learn this complex uh, system behavior, like uh, image recognition, for example. And that it takes uh, computer science uh, to sort of make it work. And this turns uh, the methodology a bit upside down compared to other engineering methods where we use mathematics to simplify the problem into something that's easy to implement. Here we let the problem definition be relatively simple, like uh, neurons and decision trees. And then we put the effort in the computer science and the programming in order to to make those simple structures work for us. So it sort of attacks the problem from a different angle. But the third and perhaps most important uh, point is to remember that, yes, machine learning done right is a very powerful tool, as evident by the examples and the, the vast number of success stories where machine learning has been used to, to do amazing things that was science fiction just a few years ago. Uh, it is a very powerful tool, uh, but it requires that it's used correctly. And it is very much an engineering discipline. It's a sort of a hands-on uh, thing, which requires this practical experience. It requires practical thinking. It's not uh, theoretical the way uh, some of this like system identification. It's a very heady uh, science to be involved in. It's a lot of complex mathematics and so on. Whereas in machine learning, it's much more practical, hands-on. Uh, that's not to say that uh, theory and mathematics isn't important for machine learning. Obviously it is. Uh, but the origin and the focus is slightly different. It's, it's more focused on what works and not what you can prove. Uh, an example of that is that very often the the famous machine learning methods, the ones that gain popularity, is the ones that are proven to have success in, for example, competitions like the Kaggle competitions. The ones who do well in the competitions and therefore prove that they are of practical use, they tend to be the most popular methods, not the ones that has the most elegant mathematical foundations and so on. That's it. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I have my email address here. Uh, if anyone wishes to contact me, uh, please feel free to do so. Thank you.